um, the HD95086 system is very similar to the one that we just saw, HD95086, very similar. And this one really suggests a really great model for planet formation. It has an inner warmer disk of dust. It has a large gap, and it has an outer cooler uh, ring of dust around the central star. It, and then, uh, and, and the, the one massive planet that has been directly imaged so far is, uh, has a large orbital separation from the planet, but it's very close to the inner, inner part of the outer cooler ring. There might be more planets forming, uh, not known yet, within this debris yet, uh, disk. It is also surrounded by an extended halo, sort of like the solar system has. So this could be a model right here of how planets, exoplanets form around other stars. Kepler 186 uh, is a five planet um, star system about 500 light years away. Uh, this uh, Kepler 186 is a red dwarf star and it has five planets. But one of the planets, Kepler um, 186f, is actually the very first validated Earth-sized exoplanet that's orbiting within the habitable zone of its star. So that is the distance at which liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet. So that's an interesting um, planet and star system. GD165, it took a while to finally determine that actually what they were seeing was GD. Uh, 165a, which is actually an L-type brown dwarf. This was the very first detected uh, spectral class L, cool brown dwarf. Um, and it is orbiting a companion that is a white dwarf, dwarf star, white dwarf stellar core. There are different methods of detecting exoplanets. Each method has advantages and disadvantages, and they also differ in the physical characteristics that they can detect, such as mass, uh, radius, or temperature. Um, radial velocity is one, using which is Doppler spectroscopy. Transit photometry, either timing or, or emission spectrum, and direct imaging of certain stellar disks. Uh, this um, graph shows a plot of the methods of detecting exoplanets by separation in the AU versus the mass of the planet. And you can see that if it's less than 0.1 AU, then transit timing predominates. But if you get out to around 1, between 1 and 5 AUs, then radial velocity dominates as the main way of detecting exoplanets at that distance uh, and that mass from their, from their uh, parent stars. Radial velocity, the Doppler spectroscopy, of course, depends on the fact that a planet and a star are actually orbiting their center of mass, which is in the interior of the star itself, and that causes the star to wobble in its orbit. So when it's moving towards us, it is um, blue shifted, and when it's moving away from us, it's red shifted, and we can look at the spectrum from this. Uh, and look at the orbital motions and watch the shifting from red to blue uh, in those emission lines, and that gives us a way to measure the mass and the orbital, uh, per the orbital period of the system. Transit timing of photometry uh, can on is only useful if the planet actually eclipses or transits across the surface of its parent star. When it does that, the light decreases, and the time to full eclipse of the planet tells the size of the planet, and the depth of the eclipse tells the size of, of the parent star. Uh, this, these two websites are really great. Uh, they're hands-on applets where you can study how all of the variables change. If you change one variable, it shows the, all the other ones changing. So it gives you a, a really good idea of how the different variables are related to each other by manipulating all of the variables in, uh, trans involving transit timing and uh, radial velocity. Uh, transit photometry, transmission spectrum, works because as the planet trans 
transmits across the surface of the planet, planet star, the, um, the light from the star uh, goes through the surface, uh, goes past the atmosphere, through the atmosphere that's surrounding the planet, and some of that, that those emissions get absorbed by the atmosphere of the planet. So the depth of the degree of those absorption lines, depending upon what wavelength you're using to do this spectroscopy, uh, can give you information about the temperature and the composition, and the molecular species and gases can all be inferred um, relative to the surface of the planet. Uh, this website uh, is an example that shows you how uh, size um, versus wavelength, how that changes, and shows up what components are there in the planetary atmosphere and by changing and manipulating those variables. So that's another uh, good website to go to to understand how these one variable affects another. Uh, direct imaging, of course, works really, really well on a debris disk because in the debris, in debris disks, there are characteristic signatures to uh, give you evidence that there might be planets or exoplanets forming there or half formed there. Uh, you know, central cavities that have cleared out because planets have accreted there, all the material and clear, cleared it out and they become a planetesimal and they're going to become a planet. There are asymmetric densities within the outer part of the disk where gas giants might be forming that might collapse or accrete or collapse, collapse out there and, and form more giant planets. And of course, very distinctive uh, gaps within the disk anywhere shows that there's something there that is gathering up all the material and probably is a planet. So if you look at the planets that we have this year and the method of detection, uh, three of them uh, are transit timing. One of them is radial velocity, and one of them is direct imaging, which is the really weird planet that's very massive and such a long, long way from its parent star.